your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to join me in the book of John, John's Gospel, chapter number 1. So we're starting a a series this morning, I've called out of the book of John that I'm going to call One Way, One Way, because John is writing a gospel here that proclaims that Jesus is that one way. So, book of John, chapter number 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 and, and then we'll pray once again. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, the title of the message today is The Effect of the Word. The effect of the word because we're, we're talking in this series in John, we're going to be talking about how Christ is that one way, Jesus is that one way, and before we get to that, uh, it must be settled that the word has an effect, and that is what John is writing uh, to the audience here, that the word has an effect. So let's pray and, and we'll uh, get into this. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. I pray you would take the preaching of your word, use it for your glory and your honor, may it uh, draw others close to you. I don't want people to leave here today and say what a great preacher or even what a great message, but what a great God and what a great Savior. I pray that you would help those that, that maybe are at a, at a moment of decision today, this morning. Perhaps there's one that needs to uh, uh, confess you and, and uh, invite you into their heart with their whole open heart. Maybe there's one here that's just discouraged and uh, perhaps today's a day they can take those burdens and those cares and cast them before you because we know that you uh, care for us. I ask that you take the rest of this time, use it for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It was the year 1898, quite a ways back. There was a man named Ben. He had left the east eight years prior to this in 1890 to go out west. He went out west with hopes of making a fortune. You ever heard people doing that, hoping that they would relocate, thinking that they would just kind of grabbed the world by the coattails. He, he was trying to do that. After eight years, Ben wasn't rich, but he did have 300 acres of good land, and he had uh, built a very comfortable farmhouse on that 300 acres of land. He raised uh, wheat, he raised corn, he raised vegetables. He'd also managed to acquire uh, a large herd of cattle, over 200 head of cattle, Having accomplished all of these things in just eight years, he decided now was the time. You may say, what time are we talking about? Now was the time for him to settle down. He decided he would place an ad in a New York newspaper. And here was the heading that he had. This was the internet dating thing back in the day, I guess. said, wanted, a good woman willing to be a pen pal. Marriage is a possibility for the right woman. Wasn't too long after that he began receiving letters from a lady named Molly. Their correspondence soon turned into love for each other. Now there stood Ben at a Kansas City train station waiting to finally meet Molly. When the train arrived, there were a lot of women getting off. Suddenly he yelled, Molly, over here! She looked right towards him and began to walk that way, smiled with her hand held out. She said, how did you know who I was, Ben? He reached into his pocket of his overalls and he said, I knew who you were from these letters. She said to him, but there are no pictures in my letters, Ben. He dropped his head a little bit and said, oh yes, there are. There are lots of pictures in your words. You see, he had spent hours reading every word of her letter, looking for every little clue that would tell him who Molly was really was. He had fallen in love with her words, words that had painted a portrait of her. God's precious word this morning paints a vivid picture of who He is. We are His bride and should fall in love with His word so then we can fall in love with the word's author. John recorded for us the heavenly perspective here. He pays attention in this book, John's Gospel or the Gospel according to John of the supernatural view of Christ. John takes a very unique approach. Most of what is in John is not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. There is nothing in John's account about Jesus' birth. There's nothing about his early childhood. The 
Baptism that he's submitted to isn't even mentioned here. There's nothing about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. John's purpose for writing this is to convince the sinner of the true person of Jesus Christ. The one true person of Christ. The only one who can redeem the sinner. He is trying to illustrate this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the importance that we must understand that Jesus was fully God and fully human. Only Jesus was powerful enough and had that supernatural enabling to take your sins and mine, make a payment for those on an old rugged cross. There was no other way, which is why I call the book of John series one way. There's not many ways. You can try many ways. But there's only one way that will be successful into a heavenly lasting eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ. So what's the effect of the Word this morning, you might ask? How should the Word affect you. There's three things I'd like to point out from verses 1 through 5 that we can see that the word should have an effect and that God gave the word not because he had, you know, I don't know how many pages exactly my Bible is, probably close to uh, 2,000 when you include the concordances and everything. God didn't say, well, I've just got 2,000 pages that I need to fill. Everything he gave was on purpose and everything he gave was to point us to Jesus. Number one, the first thing I'd like for you to see with me this morning is the relationship of the Word. The relationship of the Word. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Word, or in the Greek, logos, from God, that would make everything clear. John truly believed this was Without any doubt. He didn't sit here and say, well, I wonder if the Word's always been. I wonder if it's always been there at the beginning. He didn't wonder. He accepted that. And ladies and gentlemen, when we have a view of God's Word, like it's recorded here, that this has been something that has existed before us, it's existed before our mothers and our fathers, it's existed before all of our descendants, it's existed before the man who even penned it. When we have that faith-based view of God's Word that we believe that we have what God wanted us to have, it will change our lives. But if we sit here and we just criticize the Word and say, well, it doesn't apply in 2022 because, you know, God really didn't plan for things to last this long. When we sit here and find ways to say, well, I know it says this, but it ought to say this over here. And we just pick God's Word apart. We're going to miss out on God's blessing. We're going to miss out on what God has for us. We won't live a changed life if we come to the Bible with just a critical, skeptic view. It was as though the Holy Spirit was saying, the Word has now been spoken. When Christ, the mind of Christ, or excuse me, in Christ, the mind of God is fully revealed. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come, that He hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus was not a God. The Greek mythology talks about different gods, right? Zeus and so on. I can't remember all of them because I didn't take time to study that. But the the Greek mythology and the Greek culture teaches about different gods. He was God, meaning Jesus here was God and is God. John is explaining for us that the Word is not of anything that was created. The Word was before anything that was created. The Gospel presents Jesus as the eternal Word who in grace became flesh for our redemption. Jesus didn't come to earth just because He was sitting in heaven bored and needed something to do. He didn't come to earth hoping that something would happen a certain way. He came with the intention of redeeming you, friend. He came with the intention of taking on your sin, your suffering, and your shame on that cross. So that one day when you stand before God, you don't have to worry about, boy, I wonder about this moment in my past. Because all God sees is the blood of Christ. Just like in the book of Exodus, when that plague came, And all God saw was the blood over the doorpost. And He passed over those houses who had applied the blood. The ones that didn't have the blood, firstborn, gone. No questions asked, nothing. Do not go past go, do not collect $200. It was something that was acted on immediately because the blood was not 
there. This gospel presents Jesus as the internal word who in grace became flesh for our redemption. Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning, God. It doesn't say that God had a beginning, but in the beginning, God did something. He did what? He created the heaven and the earth. Revelation 19.13 says about Jesus, And He was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. Revelation 22.13, you may say, why is it called Revelation? Because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ interacted with uh, John on the island of Patmos and says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He existed in the beginning, not because He had a beginning as some creature or some other life form, but because He is eternal. And and don't feel bad today if you can't understand it, because guess what? I can't totally understand the fact that God is eternal, but I know the Word says He's eternal. So because the Word says it, it makes it so. Whether I can understand it fully or not, God is eternal. He is God and He was with God. Jesus is above all things. John 8, 58 says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. These statements demonstrate a time and place that predates any genealogy. The Jewish people of this time looked at genealogy, and they even bragged on their genealogy. Some would say, I'm of so-and-so. I'm of him. I'm of this person. And even some of the, uh, in the early church, some would say, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Christ. We're all of Christ if we're saved today. We're all of Christ if we've called upon Him to save us from our sins. So this was all a presentation to say, it doesn't matter about your genealogy because, you know what, everything goes back to Christ. To have a relationship with Jesus is to have a relationship with God. How do we do that? Through the Word. Jesus is God's final Word revealed for and to humanity. Jesus is the high moment of a divine revelation. Jesus didn't become deity or somehow earn it. Jesus didn't become the Son of God because He did enough works. He was the Son of God. He didn't obtain it. Rather, He was always been a deity, always in the Trinity, co-equal and co-existing. Hebrews chapter 1, the opening chapter of Hebrews gives us this, God who at sandry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers and by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He hath appeared, appointed excuse me, heir of all things, by whom He also made the worlds, who being the brightness of the glory and the express image of His Son and upholding all things by His Word and of His power when He had had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. The Word of God is the expression of God to people. There's no greater expression of that love. There's no greater expression of the mind of God through Jesus Christ. Number two, There's not just a relationship with the Word, but there is the work of the Word. The work of the Word. The work of the Word. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me. Verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, the Word has an effect. God created the world's through His Word. And Jesus is expressed as an agent of God, under God's authority, but over everything. Psalm 33 and verse 9 says, For He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Just like creation is to reveal God and His attributes, Jesus also reveals God and reveals God's attributes. But unlike creation... Jesus maintains His deity while doing so. Jesus was and is the source of all life. Therefore, He could give life to things that He created. Everything, every living thing, excuse me, owes its life to the Creator, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, 14-15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy Him, that had the power of death. That is the devil, he says, and deliver them 
who through fear of death were, of, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Outside of Christ here in Hebrews chapter 2, there is bondage. You may say, oh, Josh, you don't understand. Because of God's Word, because of what my parents tell me, or what I get told at church, I don't get to do what I want. There is true bondage in the devil who's the one that controls you outside of Christ. We have to trust that God knows best for us. I know that's not fun. I know that's not exciting. But we have to trust that God knows best. I don't think anyone here would let a toddler go up and touch a hot stove. You would try to do something to stop that toddler from touching a hot stove. You might smack their hand if you're their parent. Or if you're watching them, you'll get them away from that stove. We've got to trust that when God's keeping us from something, that He has our best interest in mind. And that's not just, well, I'm going to go to an altar one day and just agree with God. That's something you have to do every day of your life. When you wake up Monday morning, you're going to have to decide, am I going to trust what God uh, says and knows what's best for me? Or am I going to do what I want to do? And am I going to live life according to my agenda? The, the agenda of Satan is very clear, ladies and gentlemen. God's Word says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You think that there's some real serious thieving going on. We haven't seen anything in comparison to what Satan does. We see somebody still a catalytic converter. We think that's real, real thieving. And, and I'm not saying that it isn't. But I'm saying it doesn't even compare to what Satan robs people of each and every day of their lives outside of Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus, there is no life or dead men walking without Christ. He is the fountain of life. That includes both the natural and spiritual life He gives, but the alternative always takes. John 10.10, 10, The thief cometh not but for to, st- to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come. So I read part of that earlier. I got ahead of myself. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. You may think that that living life your own way is really living life, but it's really just holding off the inevitable. It's robbing you of the joy you could experience now in Christ. John 10, 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, that they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And 1 John 5 verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Where is your heart at today? Is your heart in your own desires? Is your heart rooted in what society says you should do? Because society is going gonna, is gonna to give you this advice. Some of you know this reference that I'm about to use. Follow your heart, man. That's what I do. Ever heard that before? Follow your heart, man. That's what I would do. We can't follow our heart. Because guess what? Without without my heart being given over to Jesus Christ, I can't get up here and preach. Without my heart given over to Christ, I don't know how to treat people. I'm a jerk and a scumbag outside of Jesus. It's only Jesus that helps me to be a nice, kind person. It's only Jesus that helps me do, do what I ought to do and, and, and try to do a good job at work and try to do a good job in, in ministry. It's only Jesus that causes me to do anything any good because if Josh Hall's left to himself, I don't even want to tell you what kind of a person I could be in my own flesh outside of Jesus. And until we come to grips with that, we're going to struggle experiencing revival. And until we come to grips with that, we're going to just continue struggling until we take that moment in our life and we just surrender. Maybe you need to surrender for salvation today. Maybe today's the day you realize, man, I, I know I'm lost. I know I don't have a home in heaven. I know if I were to die today, I'd split hell wide open. This might be a day where you need to call upon the Lord and simply do what that uh, publican did. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He didn't pray a written out three point prayer. He simply said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He recognized his, his state and he recognized his need for God. He admitted, he believed, and he confessed right there in that one verse. The other alternative is as a, as a believer, are we, are we playing games with God or are we just saying, well, I'm just going to do it my own way, God? As a believer, if we're going to experience revival, 
We're going to experience joy in our lives. You know what it takes? And this isn't popular. This isn't going to sell very many books at your favorite Christian bookstore. When was the last time you took your life and treated it like a blank check to God? Because that's what it takes, friends, for God to get a hold of us and for God to use us and for God to work through us. I know that's not popular. That might have gotten me in trouble here. We see thirdly and lastly this morning the nature of the Word. The nature of the Word. Look with me if you would at verse number 5. And we're, we're almost done. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That life was seen in all its perfection in Christ, man on earth. The life was the light of men as He moved about here on this earth. He cast light on every man, bringing attention to the souls as God sees, God Himself sees them. Excuse me. Jesus had always existed, but now He had come on the scene, walking with people who were outcasts, people that were hurting, people that were confused, people that were in bondage. He walked with them, leading them to joy and eternal life. If, if, you're, if you're confused, hurt, or broken this morning, guess what? You're the one that Jesus will make His way to. If you're hurt, broken at the end of yourself, you're the one that God is ready to take and use. You're the one that the Word is going to speak to. If we, if we just sit around and think, yep, got it made, yep, I'm, I'm, I, th- I think I'm okay, yep, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, yep, I've done this this week, I've read the Word, I've done, you know, list up all our things and just think that, that, that we've arrived. We're worried, we got another thing coming if we think we've arrived. If we come to a place where we don't think, boy, I need to take a moment. I'm not saying to, to do it here and fill these altars. But it may be time for us, and I think it's high time in Christianity, and it's high time in our churches to take time and get on our knees. And I'm not saying everybody ought to get on their knees, because some of you, I know, uh, uh, you, you, you'd have a hard time getting up. But, but, but think with me, if you would, the, the, in your heart getting on your knees, and in your mind getting on your knees if you can't get on them physically. Just because I wear two holes in the carpet doesn't mean... Uh, a hill of frostbitten beans unless I mean it in my heart. The nature of the Word. Because guess what? If we're we're in darkness, we're not going to understand it. The Bible says that the natural man receives not the things of God. Because it takes Jesus to help us understand things. It takes Jesus to help us understand the Bible. John 8, 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Huh? If somebody repeats something, why would they repeat it? Probably because it's important, right? When I was in college, I had to learn very early on, if somebody repeated something in a lecture, you better write it down. If they repeated it three times, it usually meant it was probably going to be on a test. Jesus repeats things not because the people he was walking with were were not very smart. He repeated it for an emphasis. God repeats things not because He needs to fill space on a page, but because there's an emphasis there. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth Me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We have to follow Him. And that means each and every day. That doesn't mean just one time. Saying one prayer and think, boy, I've got that taken care of. Because if it were that easy, we wouldn't be struggling. If it were that easy, we wouldn't get discouraged. We've got to make a decision every day. Maybe you're a young person here. I can remember back when I was 16 and I thought, man, it's going to get so much easier uh, when I'm 18 years old. Boy, I'm just going to have it so much easier when I'm 18 years old. I'm not going to struggle with anything. I'm going to walk across that stage. I'm going to get that piece of paper that's got my name on it. And I don't have to go to school anymore. <laughs> and you're laughing because you knew I had another thing coming. And then, then when I'm in, I'm in college, I'm thinking, man, this is tough. But boy, when I, when I, when I walk across that stage at W. Dow Fieldhouse and at Baptist Bible College, boy, it's going to get a lot easier for me then. I think I graduated just realizing I had more questions than I had answers. But you know what? Peer pressure doesn't stop when you're 18, 21, 24, 26. It continues each and every day of your life. It looks different, but it's there. 
I'm probably under more peer pressure now than I've ever been, and I'm only 40. It doesn't stop when you're 18. It continues on, and it continues, and it keeps coming after you, and it keeps coming after you. And what are you going to do when that keeps coming after you? Are you going to follow Jesus, or are we going to just say, well, I don't like this, so I don't like warfare, so I'm just going to give in. No, friend, all you got to do is go to Christ. Go to Him. Is it any surprise this morning that children usually have an inborn fear of death and darkness. You ever known a child that's not afraid of the dark ever at any point in their life? I think everybody's afraid of the dark to some, some uh, extent because it's unknown. You can't see what's there. Without Jesus, we are dead and in darkness. People love either the light or the darkness. And this... Excuse me, people love either the light or the darkness and this love controls their actions. What you love is going to control your actions. If you love a car, guess what? Where are you going to be at if you love a car? You're going to be under the hood. You're going to be at car shows. You're going to be talking about cars. You're going to order car magazines. You're going to have collector's cars in your house. Because it's a sign of what you love. If you love baseball... You're going to have tickets to go watch your favorite team. You're going to wear their hat. You're going to know all the players that have played for that team since 1969, possibly. Why? Because your love controls your actions. It controls what you decide to put into your head. Ephesians 2, verse 1, it says, You hath he quickened. You may say, what is that word quickened? Is that quickened loans or... No, that word quicken comes from a part of your fingernail that there's a quick there. And that's where the blood flows into your fingernail. So it's the idea that that there's life coming from something. And that Christ, when you call upon Him and you surrender to Him, He quickly puts life into you. That what you have, the good blessings in your life, flow from the result of following Him. They flow from the result of loving Him. Because if we're going to love Jesus, we've got to love the things that are important to Him, which is His Word. We also have to love other people. And I know know that's not a tough one. I know that's not a popular one. But people matter to to God. There's a sign over here that says, looked on the wrong side, it says, lost matter most. Who makes up the loss? Is Is it just who we like? It's everybody without Christ. Paul pictures here a life before Christ in Ephesians 2 1, dead and trespasses and sins. John viewed Jesus as superior to all the forces of darkness that planned or devised ways to overcome him, but they would not overcome Jesus. As we will see, Satan's plans were defeated. Satan is working overtime to keep people in darkness because darkness means death, hell, and destruction, while light means life and it gives guidance to certain places. In closing, I want to share with you something that, that's important about a word. We, we've talked about the effect of the word. The word is God's love letter to you. The word Bible, one acrostic people use is basic instructions before leaving earth. It's basic instructions. On Wednesday night, by the way, we have, we're having a discipleship time. If you miss that, We're getting into the first lesson, actually. The other stuff was introductory. But we're trying to unpack things in Scripture so we have basic instructions. We have a grasp of those things. But think about this this morning. A word's important. God's word's important and your words are important. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. The light is still shining this morning. Have you personally received that light and become a child of God? Do you know the relationship, the work, and the nature of the word today? Do you know that the word isn't just something that is supposed to be just something we read on Sunday. The Word isn't just something that we put up on a shelf higher than any other book. The Word is something for you to handle with your own hands as 
1 John writes. And what I mean by handling with your hands, not just getting it out and reading it, but, but handling it, thinking about it, meditating on what it says, meditating on what it means, meditating on some area of your life to submit and surrender to today. I'm going to pray in just a moment and we'll have a time of invitation. And this is simply a time that perhaps maybe you know you need to be saved and you need to just settle that. And if you come forward, myself or someone else can take a Bible and just take a few moments and show you what it means to be saved and show you what that is. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you know you're saved and you've never taken that first step to proclaim your faith to take that first step of, of surrender to identify with Christ. Because that's all baptism is. It's to identify with Christ. Somebody can put a wedding ring on. Does that make them married? No. Somebody doesn't have a wedding ring on. Does that mean they're single? Not necessarily. But, but somebody that has that relationship with another person, they'll want that identification mark. Imagine today if uh, you were in a relationship with somebody and they didn't want to wear a ring that you got for them. That would probably hurt, would it not? So that's why baptism is important. There's nothing magical about this tub or the water that's in here. Although I will say it's probably better than the water that comes out of Flint, Michigan. But there's nothing there. To, it, it, it's a heart decision right here. And then the last thing I want to mention is perhaps maybe this is a place you, you want to join up as a member. This is a place God wants you to be a part of. This is a place where God wants you to be part of to help make decisions and help provide service and direction for this local church. Let's pray.